Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Public Health Practice Grand Rounds for April 2010. My name is Molly Mitchell and I am the coordinator of the Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center and on behalf of the Training Center and the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and the Region 3 STD HIV Prevention Training Center, I'd like to welcome you to our presentation today of gonorrhea and the fading treatment frontier, sexually transmitted infections community update. But before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to invite you to visit our website to view our available online and face-to-face -face trainings. In addition to the trainings that we have <coughs> online, including our archived grand rounds and our public health nursing training, we also have face-to-face -face trainings coming up, including our core competency training series with Dr. Carolyn Fowler, which includes the community assessment and formative evaluation training on April 28th and May 7th, and using social marketing principles to influence decision makers on May 14th. And I'd also like to remind you that next month's Public Health Practice Grand Rounds will be on public health and urban rats with Dr. Gregory Glass. And for those of you who are watching today's presentation online, we invite you to email questions at any time for our presenter uh, to our email address at MAPHTC, that stands for Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center at jhsph.edu. And if you are watching this webcast in a group, we ask that you please let us know that by filling out our sign-in sheet so that we have a better idea of the count of people who are watching online. And with that, I'm going to uh, hand the podium over to uh, Barbara Conrad, who is the chief of the Center for Sexually Transmitted Infection Prevention at the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome again. As you may be aware, April is National STD Awareness Month. This year's tagline is get yourself talking, get tested, and as you'll hear today, a really good third part is get treated. While we, uh, when we initially worked with Dr. Rampalo to plan this seminar, we thought we were going to have a, a closer, cozier scope to things. We knew we wanted something for STD Awareness Month, and we originally intended this to be part of our Maryland State Gonorrhea Plan, focused on public and private health care providers in Maryland's highest risk counties. But through our partnership with the Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center and the Region 3 STD HIV Prevention Training Center, we realize we can now reach a much broader audience. We look forward to making this an annual offering. I would like now to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Ann Rampalo. Dr. Rampalo is a professor of medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, Division of Infectious Diseases, and in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She holds a joint appointment at the JHU Bloomberg School of Public Health in the Division of Epidemiology and the Division of Population, Family, and Reproductive Health. We are also very fortunate to have her serve as our medical consultant to the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Infectious Disease, and Environmental Health Administration's Center for Sexually Transmitted Infection Prevention, the co-sponsor of today's webcast. And she serves on the CDC STD Treatment Guidelines Advisory Committee. So welcome, Dr. Rampalo. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So, good afternoon to everyone here and everyone on the web. We're going to attack this problem and try to go through some of the uh, issues that we face now and currently. Uh, before I dive into the lecture, I need to go through some continuing education announcements that the CDC is uh, um, providing CMEs. And uh, the CDC, our planners, and myself, we have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers, et cetera. It, this presentation will not include any discussion of unlabeled use of products, and there's no commercial support for this activity. And you can read these slides as we go through. Please do. Um, we're offering 1.0 AMA Category 1 credits. I think we have CNEs also available, which is listed here. Um, and. These are, of course, objectives. What I'm going to discuss is the current morbidity trends for gonorrhea, specifically in federal region three, with particular emphasis on the state of Maryland, and discuss the current treatment recommendations for gonorrhea, 
and describe finally the clinical considerations for making a clinical diagnosis of this disease and how to actually uh, get to that diagnosis through available testing. And I want to thank our School of Medicine first year students for sharing their slides with me. Actually, I stole these slides. They're listed here. Uh, the students had to do a presentation on this, which was brilliant under the direction of Dr. Khalil Ghanem, and I wanted to thank them for sharing their slides with me. All right, if you have been on the web or actually in Britain, the Independent and BBC News, uh, gonorrhea just recently got the headlines. It's obviously gonorrhea is getting harder to treat. And this came out in a, uh, a conference where Dr. Kathy Eisen uh, explained that choosing an effective antibiotic can be a challenge because the organism that causes gonorrhea is very versatile and develops resistance to antibiotics very quickly. And you can see the BBC News said, warning of gonorrhea drug risk, and the independent fears gonorrhea is becoming untreatable. So we're going to talk about these issues, because they certainly are important. The current morbidity in our region is as followed. Um, region 3 is made up of five states in the uh, District of Columbia. And you can see I have listed here from um, taking these numbers down from the CDC website. There's a lot of gonorrhea in our region. Uh, even though the rates are coming down, for example, in Pennsylvania, if I can do this, there were uh, 11,434 specific absolute number cases about a decade ago. We are down to 10,000 uh, cases now. And uh, Maryland's doing quite well, down from 10,000 or 11,000 or so cases down to uh, 6,500 now. Nonetheless, we're not down to zero. And um, the problem is that our, our treatment options are running thin. So we do have these issues. Um, there are a lot of cases, and they're current. This is how Maryland STI rates uh, fall out. And they're higher than some of the US averages, for example, uh, in, the, in specifically uh, for gonorrhea, we rank number 19 in 2007 and remain there in 2008. And remember, the 2008 statistics are the most recent statistics available, even though it's 2010 now. Um, we still rank high in other STIs, not to be forgotten, but we're focusing on GC today. These are the rates um, in our state for gonorrhea in the city, and you can see that although the rates have been coming down nicely, they still remain high. Uh, and most of this is being driven, I would say, with, with, uh, from Baltimore City, but nonetheless, I'll show you how this falls out um, in a second according to zip code maps of our state. This is the age distribution in Maryland for chlamydia and gonorrhea. And quite frankly, throughout the United States, gonorrhea and chlamydia is a disease of the young. You can see much higher rates for chlamydia. And gonorrhea, um, which is shown in the um, striped line here, whereas gonorrhea is also high in the uh, 15 to 24-year-old group. Now. When you look at the state of Maryland, and, and, and any state in our, in our uh, jurisdiction or wherever you're listening from can do this. You can go to the CDC website and, and get information on your state's statistics. The incidence rate by jurisdiction uh, is shown here with the highest rates uh, colored in for Baltimore City being in the very deep, deep uh, red. But you can see there's other areas, other hot spots, Prince George's County, Dorchester, Wicomico, Somerset also have relatively high gonorrhea rates. If you even break this down further, you'll see that in not, it's not completely distributed throughout each county, but in specific sectors. So the bottom line is when you're listening to this and trying to decide what to do with gonorrhea, you really have to have an idea on what's going on in your community and in your catchment area to say that, oh, well, you know, if I live in a specific region of, of uh, Baltimore, my gonorrhea rates may not be that high. Um, however, other regions are high too. So I think you, ha you as a clinician have to know what's going on in and around your community. So let's talk a bit about the disease. Here's the basics. Gonorrhea, as shown here inside a polymorphonuclear cell, is a gram-negative diplococci. 
it colonizes the and infects the mucosus membrane it's an anaerobic bacteria it does non modal it doesn't form spores and it's the number two cause of bacterial s t d s in the united states the symptoms here in the presentation are shown in the male and the female in males it causes a urethritis uh, a, this is shown as a purulent pussy urethral discharge, but you know, it doesn't have to be um, this dramatic or pussy. It can be a mucopurulent discharge. It can also cause epididymitis and rectal infections, and although not listed here, also pharyngeal infections. Any place that you have contact with an infected individual, you can get it. Any place sex happens, it can happen too. This is a, a endocervical discharge here and a cervicitis in a woman. She may also have urethral infections, rectal infections, throat infections, or um, pelvic inflammatory disease, which is almost an ascension of the uh, bacteria that infect the cervix up into the womb, into the um, genital tract, fallopian tubes, et cetera, causing pelvic inflammation. Why is gonorrhea so serious then? Well, because, I mean, not only on a personal level, which I just showed you, certainly those, those infections are serious, but in a public health spin, preventative methods actually have failed to halt the disease spread. The numbers are going down, but the disease is still spreading, and it's, it's persistent. And now, to add insult to injury, we have emerging antimicrobial resistance. And that renders our ability to treat increasingly complicated. Uh, so what do we do? Tr as far as the treatment, I'm going to talk a little bit about this now. I'm going to highlight the rise of antibiotic resistance strains historically, geographically, and genetically, and try to discuss what we have now in the current treatment guidelines and maybe hint about how they are going to change when they come out, hopefully, in August of 2010. And we're going to try to appreciate better ways to manage antibiotic resistance. So here's, here's a very complicated slide um, from the Annals of Internal Medicine, which I will break down. But if you're interested, there's a really nice review by Kim Warkowski and Associates, Associates in the Annals in 2008, which goes through the historical perspective of resistance. So let me try to break this down more in a more manageable fashion. The history of resistance actually came when we first started to treat gonorrhea. Um, treatment in the pre-antibiotic era was with mercury and silver nitrate, and sometimes these were even delivered intraurethrally to kill um, the uh, bacteria, also damaging the urethra in the, in, in the consequence, as a consequence. Sulfonilamide was introduced in 1936, and you know, as soon as you introduce this, resistance starts to occur. You can see right around the 1945 or so, resistance started to be accumulating into the 50s. Penicillin was uh, introduced in 1945. It a, was a brilliant drug, but as we uh, began to use it, it, the gonorrhea also became um, familiar with it, and it took more and more penicillin, in other words, much higher doses, to kill um, the gonorrhea that was there. This is a little history of resistance as far as gonorrhea in World War II, and a poster says she may look clean, but pickups, good time girls, prostitutes, spread syphilis and gonorrhea. You can't beat the axis if you get VD. Now, um, okay. There's a lot of gonorrhea that, uh, I don't know if you can actually look at someone and say whether they have gonorrhea or not. That's the whole point. I mean, this is a nice poster, and I understand where they were going with this. But the bottom line is you can't look at somebody and know whether they have an STI or STD or not. Um, it, you know, you can superimpose anybody's face here, and it could be the same message, never made, and girl, boy, uh, it doesn't matter. So. Uh, Although this was a nice poster and a nice um, push in the uh, World War II era, there's no poster child for any STIs right now. Anybody can have it. So in 1976, gonorrhea got wise to penicillin. And uh, we had a penicillinase producing Neisseria gonorrhea. In other words, it completely annihilated the penicillin drug by um, deactivating it. 
So uh, what we ended up trying was a different antibiotic, which was tetracycline. And we started to use tetracyclines and nicely. And then in 1985, gonorrhea became resistant to tetracyclines. So by 1989, we could no longer use penicillin at all. And the CDC said, no, penicillin cannot be used in their treatment guidelines of 1989. Now, so we, we then developed uh, cephalosporins. And you may know them as uh, ceftriaxone, uh, cefixime. There's a lot of cephalosporins that uh, actually we can and continue to use. But along with cephalosporins, uh, we also started to use quinolones. And that's not listed on this slide, but if you go back to the analyst slide, you'll see that quinolones started to be used probably around the 1980s. Fluoroquinolones such as uh, ciprofloxacin, ofloxacin. And what started to happen, of course, was the gonorrhea started to become resistant to that. The first cephalosporin resistant strain actually was identified in Japan in 1998. In the 2000, cephalosporin resistant strains of gonorrhea started popping up throughout Asia. Let me go to the next slide here. If history serves, this is a, a Penn and Barry, who actually was a uh, student here at Hopkins, and Jeffrey Klausner, who works um, in the California, uh, San Francisco Health Department, wrote an article that said, if history serves as a pattern for future events, then we can expect wide dissemination of cephalosporin resistance among gonorrhea isolates in the future. So how did this work itself out geographically? Well, in the 1980s, quinolone resistance appeared in Southeast Asia. Then what we had, 1984, an isolate popped up in Australia. 1991, you can't see the Hawaii there, but uh, we detected quinolone resistant Neisseria gonorrhea in Hawaii, and, it, uh, and the quinolones were, could no longer be used there for treatment of gonorrhea. Sure enough, it started to pop up in the West Coast. Uh, reports came also out of India in the 90s and in Rwanda. Resistance was, was uh, documented. So in the 2000s, the CDC said we can no longer recommend the use of quinolones, ofloxacin, ciprofloxacin for the therapy of gonorrhea because the resistance patterns and the percentages of resistance were too high throughout the United States. It started in California. It spread throughout the West Coast. It spread among men who had sex with men, MSM populations, and then it has been documented uh, throughout the states. How are we tracking this? This is busy, I understand, but um, what this is is a window into what we have in place. It's called the Gonococcal Isolate Surveillance Project, or GISP. And there's uh, clinics and regional laboratories are located throughout the United States. And what happens, how do we keep our finger on the pulse of resistance is that and you can see Baltimore and Maryland STD clinics are members of these. And you can see there's, there's labs that are peppered throughout the United States. What happens is isolates are collected from the first 25 men who come into the STD clinics uh, who have urethral discharge and uh, approximately 28 states. And what they do is they send these isolates to regional laboratories. Our regional laboratory is um, in Atlanta. And they test it to penicillin, tetracycline, spectinomycin, superfloxacin, they're all listed here, the, all the, the cephalosporins, and azithromycin. And they do it by all time auger dilution. Figure out the minimum inhibitory concentration. And uh, they use the National Committee for Clinical Laboratory Standards to decide if, if, a, if this gonorrhea isolate is resistant or not. It is a great system to keep the, your finger on the pulse of resistance. And uh, there's a similar system that's been set up in uh, Europe and in, Lo in, in the Great Britain. It's called GRASP. Uh, but we try to keep on top of resistance through some, a mechanism like this. The Maryland State Lab is one of the few state labs that still does cultures, by the way. And um, they do track resistance monitoring, which, monitoring, which is good for us. Now, 
the genetics of resistance are shown in this slide. It's uh, Genes to Society is the name of one of our courses for the medical students, and this surely is a representation of how genes actually changing in, gen in genetics influence society. The, the treatment that we used is uh, listed here with the uh, penicillins and tetracyclines, and we had gene mutations in the gonococci that allowed uh, the gonococci to um, slip away from penicillin therapy. It was totally resistant, and they're all listed here. There's efflux pumps and, and um, pen A mutations, et cetera, and plasmids. We have tetracyclines, plasmas, and, and they're listed here, as well as fluoroquinolones, macrolids, and even cephalosporins. So we know where in the gonococci the uh, genes are mutating and the plasmids are being formed. So this is a constant battle between us coming up with better drugs against gonorrhea who wants to foil them. So what are the concerns about treatment? There's a lot of things that come into treatment. And, you know, let's start with patient non-adherence. If you choose, say, um, a medication that's not uh, point of care delivered, in other words, you don't watch the person swallow the medication, but they have to take it twice a day or over five or so days, you worry about adherence. Are they taking all the medicines? This is common, and we deal with this all the time. There's also the inadequacy of screening high-risk populations. High-risk populations, um, women who have uh, sex for drugs or exchange for drugs or money, um, men who have sex with men who have anonymous partners, or for that matter, anyone who has anonymous partners or is, in, is entering into a high-risk social or sexual network. Um, so are we in the public health arena actually finding them? Are we screening them? Do we have services that uh, will afford them to come in uh, in a non-threatening clinic or situation? That's an issue. What if I'm allergic to penicillins and cephalosporins? You know, what do you have left to give me? We have to grapple with that. There's, right now we're dealing with um, inadequate access to susceptibility tests, which I'll talk about in a second, the use of the new and sexy nucleic acid amplification tests, or NADS tests, are brilliant in, in finding the disease, but they won't tell us anything at this point about whether the disease, the gonococci, are actually uh, sensitive to our choices of antibiotics. And then, of course, we have lack of drugs being developed, and there's no incentives for um, industry to move forward on that. And then finally, we want to know, are we really getting all the d disease um, if we have inadequate surveillance? And all of these things um, feed into the limited treatment options and increased number of resistant gonococci. So in the public health arena and in the clinics, we have choices that we have to make, and they're not always easy. So the CDC recommends right now that we pick for uncomplicated gonococcal infections of the cervix, of the urethra, or of the rectum. We choose ceftriaxone, 125 milligrams, which is given IM intramuscularly in a single dose, or cefixine, which is a 400 milligram oral tablet given in a single dose, or you can give it by suspension. The alternative is spectanomycin which we cannot get in the United States. Now, you also have the, the type of infection complicates the, uh, the medication you're going to pull off the shelf because pharyngeal gonorrhea, and as you all know, oral sex is sex, okay, and you can get a gonococcal pharyngitis, which I haven't spent too much time discussing, but it does not tend to be symptomatic. It's not like you have a strep throat. You can carry gonorrhea in the throat asymptomatically quite efficiently and pass it on to someone else. Um, with that site of infection, you have to choose ceftriaxone because the other modes, um, the other, I'm sorry, antibiotics may not be as effective in killing, having high enough killing uh, rates to be, you know, easily used. There's no alternative regimen. Spectinomycin doesn't have a high enough kill rate for pharyngeal gonorrhea, even if we had it. And for disseminated um, infection, uh, we go ceftriaxone, one gram um, IM or IV every 24 hours until we have resolution, and we can chase that with um, oral regimens. However, as I said, spectinomycin is not cur currently available in the United States. 
And we only were uh, uh, able to start reusing Suffixime in April of 2008. When I say that the limited, there's limited choices, I'm not kidding. So how do we make, I mean, what feeds into the choice of antibiotics? Well, it's who, who to screen, who to test, where to do the test, and that's going to determine what's used to treat. As I said, um, treatment spe is, tr is specific to different sites, cervical, pharyngeal, rectal, I mean, I just discussed that. And you have to, you, it's almost like don't assume if I come in um, that I don't have gonorrhea of the throat. If I say that um, I don't have sex, you need to ask me the question, well, what do you mean by sex and have you been exposed and is there any reason for me to maybe do a culture of your throat for gonorrhea? Um, testing different sites, assume that you talk to your patients about those. So as a clinician, you know, every, every um, opportunity to see a patient is also an opportunity to train them, to talk to them about what sex is, how you get disease, and hopefully do a little bit of behavioral intervention um, in the uh, meantime. And then you have to pick a test, and that's not so easy. Now, it is and it isn't. Diagnostic methods that are available for gonorrhea are cultures. Cultures are brilliant. They don't cost very much. You can, they're suitable for any of the exposed sites. Um, and you can do antimicrobial susceptibility testing on a culture. The anatomic sites to test is in the response to the complaints or clinical findings and exposure history. See. I can come in with a discharge, but you have to ask me other to test also what sites have been exposed. So you have to engage in that conversation um, in persons at significant risk. So in men, urethra in all men, pharynx and rectum, depending on symptoms and exposure history, culture is great. Women, cervix should be tested, pharynx, rectum, depending on symptoms and exposure history. Um, the vagina may be tested if you don't have a cervix. Bartholin and Skeen's glands may be cultured if there's exudate. And I didn't show pictures of that, but if someone comes in with a, a Bartholin abscess, certainly you can culture that discharge that you will see uh, for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Now, what we've been using, however, is, are the new non-culture tests. And, and the one that's used most frequently is the amplified test, nucleic acid amplification test, which are, are listed here. It could be polymerase chain reaction tests, which are PCR, manufacturers are listed, transcription-mediated amplification tests, which are called TMA, there's strand displacement, et cetera. And the advantages of these tests are that they're highly sensitive. The FDA has cleared these tests, any of these NATs, for endocervical and anal swabs from women, urethral swabs from men, or even a urine specimen, a first catch um, urine specimen for boys or girls, men or women. So urine specimen is even adequate to do these tests, and some are listed here. Also, the Aptima Combo 2 can be, is cleared by the FDA for self-administered or for administered vaginal swabs. So if a girl says, I don't want to get up on the stirrups, I don't want the examination, you can do a vaginal swab and send it. It's that good. Some tests, you can use one sample, one swab for both gonorrhea and chlamydia. However, there's a glitch. The FDA has not cleared these tests overall for oropharyngeal, for pharynx, for oral, or rectal specimens. Though, if your laboratory has gone through the process of validating these tests against cultures, it's fine. But not all laboratories have actually done that. So again, not only do you have to be aware of what gonorrhea is doing in your community, you have to know what the laboratories in your community, where you're sending the tests, what they can do for you. There's a concern about cross-reactivity with some tests um, with other gonorrhea species, particularly in the oropharyngeal site. And that's one of the reasons why um, it's not completely FDA cleared. But remember, sensitivity is as good, if not better, than culture. Now, there are some non-amplified tests which can be used, and they're listed here. They're not as, in, as sensitive as nucleic acid amplification tests from all sites, no matter what sites. So the test of choice is NATS. Thus, cephalosporins right now are the only antimicrobial agent that the CDC, and actually 
probably WHO are recommending for gonococcal infections. What if I have an allergy to cephalosporins? That's, a, that's an issue. A person with a penicillin allergy is three times more likely to be allergic to another medication, and they're listed here. Dermatologic rashes, et cetera, is like one to almost 3%. Fever, eosinophilia in, as a result to um, the penicillin uh, can be as high as 8%. But mind you, look, anaphylaxis is low. You have to ask the questions, however. If I'm a patient that says to you, when I got penicillin, I had, was intubated and had, to be trach had a tracheostomy, that's a real anaphylactic reaction. You must respect that. However, if I said that when I received ampicillin when I was six months old, my mother said I had a rash, that may not, that's, may not be uh, a, a true reaction. So, I mean, you, you have to ask questions and weigh it uh, before you um, make a decision that this person is truly allergic. Cephalosporin allergies, uh, pers this is what you can, you can use in special populations. Persons who can't tolerate cephalosporins or quinolones, CDC should be treated with spectinomycin. Now, mind you, we don't have spectinomycin available currently, but this still stays in the treatment guidelines. And you have to remember that if you're going to treat them, with spectinomycin, it will have no activity or not good activity below, I think it's 75% killing rate for oropharyngeal gonorrhea. Really test for allergy to cephalosporins. It's currently unavailable, but some people do um, desensitize with starting with very small allergists with very small levels and diluted doses and then ratcheting up the dose. An alternative drug is two grams of azithromycin orally. Um, you can do this. It is available if they have true allergy to cephalosporins and penicillins. You've got to make sure, however, that uh, they clear because, and that they don't throw up the two grams of azithromycin, which can be very, um, very na uh, nauseating. Um, the best option is to desensitize. Contraindication, even if isolates are not resisted, obviously, pregnant women should not be treated with quinolones or tetracyclines, and that's an issue. Okay. Now, all is not perfect with azithromycin. There has been decreased susceptibility to azithromycin, and we must keep this in mind. Again, the most current uh, GISP surveillance project has reported some um, resistance, and uh, we need to watch that and, and keep, uh, keep, keep a lot of um, focus on this problem because, again, there's not a lot of medic there's no medications coming down the pike. So solutions to be implemented or reinforced is uh, on a national and international level, but also right here, uh, is to increase surveillance and try to collaborate. This is with an, uh, international partners as, cause, because you saw geography. If you see, um, you know, something going on in Japan or in Asia, it will come quickly to us. Um, evaluate the factors associated res with resistance if we can, and maintain the capacity to monitor resistance. You can't throw out cultures and susceptibility tests quite yet, unless we have some new sexy way to find the gene that's associated with resistance and, and come up with it on the nucleic acid amplification test. We cannot throw these old-time cultures out so quickly. We need to invest in research. Incentives for drug discovery and collaborations with pharmaceutical industries is part and parcel of attacking this gonococci. Um, and impl implement adequate screening programs for high-risk population. Now look, high-risk population is sexually active women less than 25. I mean, that's sexually active women. So annual screening for men who have sex with men, if you are in, um, an HIV clinic and say, oh, you know, my men, my MSM don't, they're, they're, they're not having any sex, everything's great. Don't assume that. Ask, how's your sex life? Did you meet a new partner? Regardless of signs or symptoms, screen. It should be driven by risk behaviors, not necessarily symptoms. Screen every three to four months after a confirmed infection. People who have gonorrhea or chlamydia tend to get it again, whether it's because they 
haven't gotten their partner treated or because they don't reconnect with their partner but reconnect with someone in the sexual network who, where there's a high prevalence of gonorrhea. These people need to be retested. Um, and then obviously treat sexual partners, any sexual partner that can be identified in the past 60 days. Comments regarding treat sexual partners. Um, well, let's talk about this for a second. Um, classic partner services can indeed play a role here. In other words, um, telling the person about the uh, complications of gonorrhea and asking them to refer their partner in. Some, in some jurisdictions, actually, they still do contact tracing for gonorrhea. Um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania did an intensive gonorrhea project over a decade ago, and they showed that classic partner identification and treatment methods did make a difference. In other words, you're the disease intervention specialist at the health department. You talk to me and say, and tell me the names of your partners. If you can't talk to them, I will in, a, in an anonymous fashion and get these people in. Um, the problem is that we cannot always sustain these activities because we don't have enough funding. So um, what we try to do is come up with a better mousetrap to get partners, um, partners treated. Counseling the person to tell their partners is one way. Some, in some states, we're doing expedited partner therapy. It's not blessed in the state of Maryland yet, but if I have gonorrhea, you give me medication to deliver to my partner. The effect of that is that I tend not to have as many recurrent infections. So that's an option, and you can go to the cdc.gov website, look up expedited partner therapy, um, and see if your state actually is, is one of the states where it's allowed. So overall, this means that as healthcare providers, we have the uh, option of, t of counseling people about what they can do and always to refer their partners in. But you may, as a healthcare provider, be contacted by your lo local health department for more additional information on the patient to make sure that their partners have been treated. So don't be surprised if someone from the health department actually contacts you. And they might do this for gonorrhea and HIV too. It's all part of the partner services that we have available in state and local health departments to try to contain these diseases. Um, what this means for your clinical practice, besides using the right drug, again, this is the get yourself tested, get yourself talking, get yourself testing month for clinicians. Uh, remember to be assertive in your practice and get the discussion going. And don't assume that your client is going to raise the issue. Because um, they may be, like my mother, God rest her soul, they tested me for everything when I asked her what they did. So you have to make sure that you start the discussion with your patients. Um, test multiple sites if that patient has multiple sites exposed. Um, and then pick the correct therapy, which we talked about, and always encourage that patient to get their partners in, however means that you have available. Work with your local health department. Um, if they are able to do partner services, then certainly get them involved. Refer them cases directly. Because, you know, we always count on our laboratories to do the reporting for us, but sometimes you have to be proactive. And again, I'm going to say this also for syphilis. Remember, gonorrhea is local, meaning that if you're seeing an increase in your patient population, you should tell the health department so that they can get word out. Because actually, you may be seeing an increase in the whole area. And it's nice to know, since we're in the public health arena, to try to get to that um, quickly. If you work in an emergency or urgent care setting, anyone that's listening from out there, test and treat is a good idea. Yes, test, but treat because you may not see them again. And try to do follow up with the local health department to, to bolster that care and make sure that that's, the partners are getting treated if you can't contact that person who was positive. So again, we go back to um, <coughs> limited treatment options and increased numbers of resistant gonococci, but hopefully we can uh, attack these um, one by one. And we talked a little bit on how to do that. There's no combination therapies approved yet. Um, and these are some of the research uh, questions and uh, clinical trials that are being considered by the Centers for Disease Control and the STD uh, 
clinical trials group, and that's, that's testing azithromycin with the gemafloxacin, which is a new type of, of uh, cephalosporin um, uh, quinolone. It may hold promise. Um, in the absence of new drug discoveries, maybe we're going to have to do combination therapies uh, from old drugs, for example, like gentamicin, to sort of hold the, uh, the hold of fort until we can come up with a new medicine. So we're thinking about this, but it's not quite there yet. The Centers of D Disease Control, um, I'm not saying that this is uh, written in stone because I haven't seen the treatment guidelines, but they are discussing on increasing the dose of uh, ceftriaxone from 125 to 250 milligrams um, in a single IM delivered dose. The World Health Organization is already doing that, and I do believe that the CDC will probably follow suit in their August, hopefully August 2010 treatment guidelines. If you're interested, we're going to stop. I know I'm a little bit early, but that's always okay for a lunch um, lecture. The references are listed here if you need to have any information more so. And for continuing education credits, they're available from the CDC at listed here, www.2a.cdc.gov slash backslash T-C-E-O online. No, T-C-E online. Okay, it's listed here. Uh, you have to complete the online evaluation with the course numbers that are listed here details to follow, and here they are, so I'm going to leave this up. I should go to the next slide. Okay. Okay. Email questions to <laughs> maphtc at jhsbh.edu, and we are open for questions from the audience or the web, so let's go. never heard this before. Um, I mean, they're not really in STD prevention, but still, it seems like not a lot of people realize that this is an issue, and I'm, I'm just kind of wondering why not or how can we get this information out so maybe people will be a little more cautious with their sexual practices when they realize that there's something out there that they might not be able to treat eventually. Should I repeat the question? Or do, are we good? The guys in the back? Do I have to repeat the question for the online group? No one's at all I will. Why are people not aware of this, and how can we get the message out that gonorrhea is becoming resistance, and for your own sexual health, you may want to take better precautions from getting it? You know, that's a great question. Um, it's been in the academic press, obviously, you can see, for the past 10 or so years. Um, and it just hit the press in Britain. I think the CDC will be put, I mean, has in their website consistently updated this. And again, it's for a lot of clinicians. But I think you walk a fine line between, as you know from the School of Public Health, between, you know, educating the public and then causing hysteria. Um, and I think the CDC is trying to um, walk that line nicely. We're not to the point, I don't think, that we need to you know, be hysterical about this, but we need to be cautious and understand the reasons why these, you know, this is happening. And, and with any delivery of antibiotics, we have to think, what are we using? Why are we using it? Are we misusing it? And is it, you know, is it appropriate? And, you know, that's just, that's just a public health cry in general for resistance. Yes. Dr. Gray. Why do you think so much drug resistance comes out of Southeast Asia, whether it be with STIs or malaria? The question was, why do, what, what do I hypothesize is one of the reasons where a lot of the resistance starts and comes out of Southeast Asia. One of the hypotheses is that it's very easy to get medication over the counter or from a pharmacist if you walk in and say, oh, I have X, Y, and Z, and medications are given. Um, and that was one of the hypotheses as to why quinolones became resistant at a rapid rate. It's overuse and misuse um, of medications. When you, and I think that probably drove it. Then some of the his, history about how it came across was from tourism then to the islands. And, and But we have airplanes now that take resistance everywhere. So I think it was the misuse of antibiotics or the uh, easy availability. Can I ask a follow-up? Yes. Um, what efforts are being made to improve 
drug uh, availability and appearance in Southeast Asia. Because even in malaria, artemisinin resistance is emerging. And it's all coming from the same place. Yeah, and if you know, please <coughs> chime in. But I don't know of any programs that are addressing this currently. Uh, I think it's going to take a serious effort that may be spearheaded by WHO to um, address this. But yes, we should. I mean, we're, we're a global community, and we need to address this on a, on a lot, for a lot of diseases. Yes? OK. From the web world, we have questions. Let's go. Do you recommend? In routine, do you recommend in routine STD screening among MSM populations, screening for both pharyngeal and genital urinary gonorrhea? Now, okay. Yes, screen, I recommend screening based on uh, risk behavior. For example, if I'm an MSM, a man who has sex with other men, and I'm mutually monogamous with my partner, um, that's one thing, and I don't need screening. It doesn't matter if I'm MSM or not, quite frankly. Um, I could be heterosexual, bisexual, whatever. If I am in a mutually monogamous relationship, well then, you know, and, and I truly believe that, and so does my partner. I mean, okay, do you have to screen? No. But if I come in and say, you know, you say to me, and how's your sex life? And I say, well, I met someone new, perhaps you should screen me. A new partner puts you at risk for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, and you need to talk to me about that. Now, screening is different than a diagnostic test. A diagnostic test, I'm coming in with signs or symptoms. You're going after those signs and symptoms. But screening is according to risk. If I say that I've met, I have one partner, one partner, however, I met a couple people on the internet and had sex with them on Friday night, that's risk. So anonymous partner, that's risk, and I should be screened. So yes, I do recommend screening according to risk. Why can't spectinomycin be obtained in the United States? I don't know. Um, it has to do, I guess, with cost and whether drug companies want to actually manufacture it or not. Um, margin, cost, profit margin. Is Suprax being used, tested to treat gonorrhea? I believe Suprax is, what's the other word for Suprax? Suffixime, and yes, it is. Suprax is suffixime, and it is recommended as an oral alternative to ceftriaxone. So if you have it, it's brilliant. You can give it to your patient, they swallow it, you watch them swallow it, and always co-treat for chlamydia with either doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice daily for a week, or azithromycin, um, one gram orally but always co-treat. And quite frankly, because they travel together, gonorrhea and chlamydia are good buddies and they travel together, but quite frankly, it's probably giving us a leg up on deterring resistance um, of the gonorrhea further. Yes, another question. Thank you, internet people. When can NATS testing accurately retest a patient after treatment? Dr. Gatos, one of our, um, one of our <laughs> Our specialist is in the audience and she's holding up three fingers. Are you saying three days? Three weeks. Or three weeks, yeah. Okay. Um, remember, nucleic acid amplification tests are picking up pieces of the DNA or RNA of that unique uh, bug that you're testing. So for gonorrhea, it would be the gonococcal uh, polymerase chain reaction picking up pieces of its DNA. It's not a test of cure. In in um, classic sense, because you're not doing a culture. Culture would be, yes, I'm culture positive, the organism grows, and I, you treat me, and then I test to see if the organism is dead. Gnats will pick up dead organisms. So you have to give the body a chance to clear the dead organisms. So that's designated three weeks. OK. All right. Another question, do you recommend test of cure for persons with positive pharyngeal culture who are treated with other drugs than IM ceftriaxone? No, I, well, this is, for example, suffixime plus one gram of azithromycin or two grams of azithromycin. Test of cure has not been recommended with the cephalosporin ceftriaxone, ceftriaxone or suffixime in general because the... Um, Cure rate is so high. It's like 97 to 99 percent. 
pharyngeal, cervical, urethral, rectal sites. It's very good. However, azithromycin ranks in the maybe 90 to 95%. You don't have to do a test of cure, but if you're concerned about it, a test of cure would be nice with culture. So not with the cephalosporins. I consider it with azithromycin. Um, again, it will depend on whether your patient shows up or not. But the percentage, I think, is 93% cure rate with the zithromycin two grams for um, gonorrhea. I test the throat though. Okay. Could you comment on health disparities for African Americans for gonorrhea and how to approach that as a public health department or provider? There is health disparity in many, if not all, sexually transmitted infections. Gonorrhea, uh, chlamydia, not, chlamydia is an equal opportunity offender across the board, uh, with syphilis also. Uh, what do we have to do, I think, is we have to make African Americans in our communities aware, um, de-stigmatize uh, screening, and try to uh, get people to engage in, in coming in and getting screened and treated. Um, it's not an easy, it's not an easy task. With the syphilis, I'll go to syphilis, with the Syphilis Elimination Project, which started in, the 19, in 1996, actually, uh, concerted efforts by local health and national health departments were to um, get the communities involved in education, uh, particularly the African-American uh, communities in education about the disease and where it is and how to get treated. And that really, with community-based outreach, that really helped decline the uh, disparity rates between African Americans and other races. However, um, we have to continue to do that. So it's, it's not something that is uh, once and done. We have to educate and continue the support. Another question, is there any chance of <laughs> vaccine development for gonorrhea? I'm laughing because there, there are some researchers who are in here that, that really would love to find a vaccine. There is a fervent wish uh, and a lot of research to that effect, but we're not there yet. Um, many people are pursuing a vaccine, but we haven't cracked that code. So, are we good? I have one more coming off the line. But yes. For states that are um, considering um, expedited partner therapy, Yes. Given the rise of resistance to gonorrhea, would you recommend that they do chlamydia and gonorrhea cluster patch and prescriptions for just chlamydia <coughs> only? So to really, you can't track... Expedited um, partner therapy, I believe they give therapy for... Oh, I'm so sorry. The question was, if I am a would I recommend states that are doing expedited partner therapy to co-treat for gonorrhea and chlamydia? Would you recommend co-treating if a state's going down the path towards considering legalizing expedited partner therapy and they're trying to consider whether to do chlamydia only treatment or chlamydia and gonorrhea treatment? For identified cases. For identified cases. Repeat oh. the question. If a state if if a state uh, is going down the path to decide what therapies to use should they treat for gonorrhea and chlamydia regardless of, of, the, of the pathogen? Is that what you're saying? So if I come in with chlamydia, should I be treated for gonorrhea and chlamydia? I think what you're, you're asking I am, I, 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 is, are we so worried about gonorrhea resistance that EPT should not be available for gonorrhea? Okay, so in other ways, are we so concerned about the resistance of gonorrhea that EPT should not be available for gonorrhea? No. Okay. I think the, to answer that question, um, I think it would be more dangerous to only give azithromycin if someone and you missed gonorrhea. And in, in other words, expedited partner therapy. Should I? If if uh, let's put it in let's put it in perspective. If you know, if I come to see you and I've had a gonorrhea and chlamydia test already, and I'm in front of you with chlamydia only, not gonorrhea. 
you may choose to give me expedited partner therapy for chlamydia only. Now, whether that's going to have any effect on the population, I don't know. However, if I come in front of you and I have a discharge and you decide that you're going to treat me for gonorrhea and chlamydia and you're going to do expedited partner therapy, well then perhaps you need to do both. Now we have an expert here for expedited EPT who's going to speak to that right so now. So most of the CDC guidelines are that you need a, um, a documented diagnosis. So the ideal procedure, if you treat someone for gonorrhea, I see you today, you're dripping, I'm going to treat you today, but I'm, going to wait for the, I'm not going to wait for the results. You can't give EPT in that. Okay, so right now, the CDC recommends EPT only when you have a documented yeah. diagnosis of a pathogen. So in other words, you can't do syndromic EPT. So for example, in Baltimore, we don't um, culture men for chlamydia. Uh, we don't do nades for men. So every man is just diagnosed with NGU, so they are not allowed to do EPT. Do you want me to repeat that? No? Okay. Yes. Dr. Grant, you had a question. Um, I'm going to lay my uh, neck on the block. Uh-oh. Um, Dr. Gray is preparing to lay his neck on the block for those of you that are online. Okay, go ahead. Um, we have been routinely using Zithro and Cipro um, non-pregnant and um, Zithro and Cipixine for the woman who's pregnant as treatment for uh, either gonorrhea or chlamydia in Uganda. Okay, this is the Uganda Rakai study and they have been treating uh, women with gonorrhea <laughs> with um, ciprofloxacin and azithromycin, two grams or one gram? Um, we were up to two. No. Two grams. And then pregnant women with suffixium and two grams of azithromycin. Now, is he in trouble? Well, I tell you, there is evidence of ciprofloxacin resistance coming out. Hopefully it will be published soon uh, from a study done in Macarere STD clinics by um, Dr. Oh, I'm blocking his name. It will be coming out soon. And there is a high enough percentage of ciprofloxacin resistance in that population to merit not using it. Uh, obviously, it would be nice to do some testing on the specimens that you get to confirm that. But in general, this is one of the few studies, and hopefully we'll get it published soon, um, from Uganda that documents that the WHO old guidelines uh, are no longer applicable. So, something to keep in mind. Should we be covering patients who test positive for chlamydia for gonorrhea as well, even if they test negative? No. <laughs> I'm going to answer that simply. The CDC does not recommend that we do that. If you have test results in front of you, you need to treat according to um, the test that's positive. Otherwise, we're going to be, again, misusing the uh, gonococcal therapy. What about their partners? We, I think we just answered that hopefully um, with uh, the EPT discussion that we treat to the test result. All right. Why are partners in past 60 days treated and not those in six months? Well, because we are trying to do the best uh, shot at incubation periods. Quite frankly, um, with gonorrhea, the incubation period is relatively fast in men. So it's a, the incubation period for a man who has run into someone who has gonorrhea on Friday night would be, and is inoculated with gonorrhea, they would incubate perhaps for 24 to 48 hours and come in with a discharge theoretically on Monday morning. Um, we do 60 days because we're not always certain how long it takes for a woman to incubate gonorrhea or chlamydia for that matter. So 60 days is a uh, cushion whereby we think most transmissions will occur. And that's why we do that. Six months, actually a study has been done on how long um, men, or, yes, men can remain culture positive for gonorrhea and be asymptomatic. And actually what happens, uh, this was done way before internal review boards were established. This was in the 19, what, 60s. Um, and what happens is men who have been inoculated and infected with gonorrhea and are asymptomatic, if you follow them and don't treat them, they will either become symptomatic 
or self-cure within about a 60-day period. So that's also um, data that back up this recommendation. Oh, there's another question buried here. How do you test for gonorrhea in the throat? Culture. Uh, you do a pharyngeal culture, very much like a strep throat culture where you go back to the pharynx. And it's on special media, Thayer Martin media, which is modified antibiotic media, chocolate agar that's um, cooked and exploded, and, but there's has antibiotics um, uh, in it to kill the bacteria that grow naturally in the throat and allow the gonorrhea to, to present itself. So culture is the way to go. Although, if you have actually confirmed the use of NATS testing in your laboratory compared to culture, you can use that. And the CDC is now working on recommendations on how to do that and perhaps even get that out and press uh, so that labs will know how to do this and get that ball rolling. Can you comment on geographic risk? Many with relatively low risk behaviors are at risk due to prevalence in their community. That's absolutely true. Um, Baltimore communities, to pick on us, I mean, we have a lot of uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia in certain, in actually in all, almost all of our neighborhoods. So if you go out and have maybe two or three partners um, that, you know, at the age of, I don't know, I'll make this up, 21, you could be at higher risk than if you go to East Elbow, South Dakota, and have two or three or four or five partners um, at age 21 because the, the geographic prevalence in that area is not that high. However, if I'm from East Elbow, South Dakota, and I go to Las Vegas and have three or four anonymous partners, you know, what happens in Las Vegas doesn't always stay in Las Vegas, even though the commercials say that you can bring that back. So it's a combination of geographic risk, but it's also a combination of personal risk, and you have to weigh and screen appropriately. Okay. Any other questions? There's two chlamydia questions. Okay, there's two chlamydia questions, and then I think we'll wrap it up, and you can all have lunch. Here we go. Put the slide up and show some how to get your... Okay. Do you think the chlamydia rates are high due to patient returning too soon for a test of cure? No, I do not think that that's true. I think chlamydia rates are high because there's a high prevalence of chlamydia within uh, the young people community. And I believe that uh, what happens is you may meet Prince or Princess Charming um, and they'll be your always and only for about six months and then you go back into the infected pool. Uh, so I think that that's one of the reasons why it's high. We just have high chlamydia rates. Has chlamydia shown any tendency toward drug resistance? That's an excellent question. There have been, oh, there have been some reports out of Sweden, correct? Mary in the back? No. There have been some reports um, out of the, the Sweden um, area where uh, there have been some doxycycline resistant, I believe, chlamydia or azithromycin resistant chlamydia, but it's not, it is not ready for prime time. It's not anything that we need to be worried about. Although in the literature you may find one or two reports, but it's not an issue as I speak today. All right, I would like to thank you all for listening. I need to go back to this continuing education credit from the CDC. To receive credit, complete the online evaluation and post-test using course number EC1700 or WD1700. And uh, the, the opening, it, it, the, the origination date is obviously today with expiration. It's going to be up on the web and you can still get your CME credits up, into, up and including to May the 21st. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we're signing off from the School of Public Health, and thank you for listening. <laughs>